Hi again. So this next talk it refers to how the use of ultrasonography could potentially help us prevent both intravascular injection and nerve injury. I have uh, no disclosures to make regarding commercial interests. I do would like to acknowledge, though, the um, support of different professional associations, including the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, the ASA, the CAS, and the University of Toronto, and our, my colleagues and partners at the Toronto Western Hospital for supporting my academic activities throughout the years. So I'd also like to take an opportunity to welcome you all once more to sunny Toronto. We have a lot of attendees from other cities and other countries. This is uh, what Toronto looked like four months ago, and that's why we organized it in June. <laughs> so this topic, and in fact this whole panel, has to do with safety. So this gentleman here on this picture is actually in quite uh, dire circumstances. Um, I'm not sure how good he is at uh, tight rope walking, but given his clothes, I'm not sure he knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, he could fall any time, and if he falls into this uh, crocodile-infested swamp, I think his prognosis should not be too good. Now, thankfully, regional anesthesia is quite different from this situation. Uh, certainly, even before the, uh, the use of, ultras of ultrasound, regional anesthesia was quite a safe practice. We've been uh, doing it for many decades, and the incidence of serious complications like permanent nerve injury and local anesthetic toxicity, severe ones, are quite low. Um, so I don't need to tell to this audience that there has been a paradigm change in the last 10 years. We used to perform our blocks mostly based on landmarks, surface landmarks, and based on indirect indications of nerve to needle contact of nerve location. So for example, for supraclavicular blocks, if this is the head of the patient uh, towards the feet of the patient here, you know this anatomy very well and it's been discussed multiple times uh, yesterday. Uh, the nerves are in very close contact with major vessels and for example with the lung. Uh, so there's really been a, a, a paradigm cha change in the last uh, few years as we were saying. Um, because, for example, with this block in particular, given these close anatomic relationships, before the advent of imaging, really there weren't very many colleagues that were doing this block because of the uh, concern of safety and complications. Now that we have imaging, we can see this anatomy very clearly. We can see the subclavian artery. We can see the pleura. We can see the nerves. So one should think, common sense would tell us that if we have all this fantastic information now with imaging, we should be able, you know, our blocks should be a no-brainer. They should be able to work all the time, and they should be able to be extremely safe. So what does the data tell us? We're going to concentrate on two areas which are the most significant or perhaps serious complications, intravascular injections and local anesthetic systemic toxicity and nerve injury, specifically in the area of peripheral nerve blockade. I'm not going to refer to neuroaxial or perineuroaxial techniques. So the, there's a number of ways in which using ultrasound could help us prevent intravascular injection and local anesthetic toxicity. The most important one is that it helps us to be much more precise in where we place our local anesthetic. And this increased precision should help us reduce the incidence of unintended intravascular injections. And I have to say, if you read all the case reports, for regional anesthesia practice, the vast majority of the severe cases of LAST are due to a perfectly safe dose if you give it uh, in the interstitium but ended up in the intravascular space. So most of, most of these problems are related to direct intravascular injection. So if we can see the vessels and we can see the nerves and we can see the needle, we should be able to uh, lower the incidence of these injections. And also, perhaps as a secondary um, mechanism, by reducing the amount of local anesthetic that we um, can use, um, that should be a secondary mechanism by which we can avoid uh, this complication. So 
because this is such a rare um, problem, uh, local anesthetic toxicity, severe ones, cardiac arrest, in particular, it's, it's not that common. So it's very difficult to draw uh, information specifically about LAST from randomized controlled trials. Um, we cannot have that kind of data. But we do have um, you know, surrogate uh, measurements, surrogate data from randomized studies that looked as a secondary outcome to the incidence of intravascular injection. So there's a number of them. In particular, this meta-analysis by Abrahams 2009 studied 13 randomized control trials that were looking at uh, the efficacy of um, uh, ultrasound-guided techniques compared to nerve stimulator. And as a secondary outcome, these four studies in particular, among the four, they had 240 patients, so they are small studies individually. Uh, they were looking as a secondary outcome at the incidence of unintended um, intravascular injection, or I should say rather vascular punctures, unintended vascular punctures. And all four studies had at least a trend towards a benefit with the use of ultrasound, which makes common sense that we would expect that. And if you look at the combined um, uh, result from the four, uh, there was actually a significant uh, decrease in the number of vascular punctures when ultrasound is used. Now, the risk ratio was 0.16. That means that, on average, you would expect to be only 16% as likely to puncture a vessel if you're using ultrasound versus not using it. Um, and in the worst case scenario, if we are really pessimistic, we are at least a reduction by half, 0.47, or in the best case scenario, we can reduce that incidence 20-fold. So I think, I think this is uh, clearly going a step in the right direction. Now, how about incidence of episodes of severe local anesthetic toxicity per se? And I'd like to uh, call your attention to this study. It's a retrospective study, but I think it's quite interesting. It's real life. Um, it's a retrospective study of a single institution, I believe in Pittsburgh, with over 5,000 patients in which they are describing retrospectively their experience over the first three years of ultrasound experience. So we have to keep this in mind as well, because ultrasound, as we all know, is something that is very operator dependent. And these were really the first three years of experience using ultrasound for these group of colleagues, of anesthesiologists. And one would think that uh, in those first three years, they had a lot more previous experience using the comparator, the nerve stimulator, versus using ultrasonography. Nonetheless, in those three years, they had five patients who developed seizures following a peripheral nerve block. Those five patients, um, in, in a number, a total number of three, over 3,000, those five patients were in the group in which only nerve stimulator had been used. And in the, those, that, those group of patients in which the combined technique was used, they had no cases of seizures. Again, this is not a particular study that is powered for that. It's retrospective, so it has all those limitations. But it is real life, and I think it's, you know, for these kind of rare events, this is sometimes as best a data as we can expect to have. So I think this is quite significant. Now, again, there's, we have to keep this in mind. There are some limitations for compar when we do comparative studies of interventional procedures. <clears throat> it's not that difficult to compare drug A to drug B. You know, you're comparing, let's say, an antihypertensive. You make the pill look exactly the same versus a placebo or a drug A versus drug B. Everything else is controlled for. There's not many other factors that are going to influence this if you pick your patients right. However, when we're doing interventional procedures, there may be patient factors that affect your outcome. There's certainly um, instrument or equipment factors, which is what we are trying to study here. And there's also operator factors. You know, somebody once said there's two pricks to a needle, and the most important one is the proximal one. So obviously, you know, obviously there's, there's, we have to be humble and remember that the ultrasound equipment is not going to do everything for us. In fact, the most important part of the work is going to be us. It's going to be how we interpret that uh, information and what do we do about it that's going to make a difference. <clears throat> 
So what happens with nerve injury? You're going to hear a lot about nerve injury in the upcoming pro-con debate, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, but um, I do like this. Uh, I learned a lot reading this prospective review, um, also 2009, from Australasia. It's a prospective review of eight different institutions over... Um, um, close to 7,000 patients undergoing about 8,000 uh, peripheral nerve blocks. And this, I think, puts in perspective what is the current modern incidence of nerve injury following peripheral nerve blockade. It's not that common. In fact, of the 7,000, roughly 7,000 patients, about 30 presented with neurologic symptoms or neurologic deficits following surgery. They were all followed up by neurology and thoroughly studied. And in fact, of those 30, only three ended up having a, um, you know, confirmed or at least strongly suspected block-related nerve injury, while the other 27, there were other causes identified, such as a preoperative neuropathy that hadn't been picked up or a surgical cause. So I think this is, seems to be consistent with our experience, with our practice, and I think this is, on one hand, relatively reassuring that the overall incidence is quite low. <clears throat> Now, when we talk about block-related nerve injury, it's not a, a straightforward process, and it's not a single element that can contribute to these nerve injuries. There may be mechanical elements, such as needle injury per se. There could be chemical components, such as the amount and the concentration of the local anesthetic. And there may be patient predisposing factors that make them more prone to these complications. So again, the um, prevention strategies are going to be multifactorial and not as simple as one intervention. So um, you're going to hear a lot about this, as I said, in the coming pro-con debate, but I think we, it is fair to say, and we all accept the fact uh, we've known for many decades, that when you do inject local anesthetic into a nerve, you can, at least in some instances, cause significant nerve tissue disruption, significant nerve injury, compared to, for example, when you inject the local anesthetic just around the nerve. This is topical application. This is intraneural application. This is a very old study, very pivotal studies from the 1970s from Sealander. These are newer studies. These are all animal models, and they all, they all show um, you know, similar results. Now, certainly not every time this ends up with, in a clinically apparent deficit, but there is at least histological evidence of quite severe tissue damage. So can ultrasound help us prevent nerve injury? Well, um, in, in the um, special review of the ultrasound literature in 2010 in uh, RAPM, Dr. O'Neill, who was in charge of the section on patient safety, he reviewed 22 randomized control trials, but as you can see, there were only about 2,000 patients in all these randomized trials combined. So if we have a baseline incidence of about 1 in 2,000, 1 in 3,000 patients, we'll never get this kind of data to be able to have a conclusive, conclusive uh, answer. But we have to draw our answers from you know, the second best kind of data, which is large perspective reviews and retrospective reviews. So... <clears throat> so um, again, in this uh, prospective audit from Australasia, um, they had, as we said, only three peripheral nerve injuries. So these were two in the nerve simulator group of about 2,000 patients, so an incidence of approximately one in 1,000, and they had one in over 5,000 ultrasound-guided procedures, so this was maybe an incidence of one in 5,000. Again, these are very small numbers, so it's not absolutely conclusive, but at least we can say that we're seeing trends in the right direction. Uh, this other uh, single retrospective review from Orbo um, also shows that in the group in which they used the combined technique, they had no nerve injuries. This is retrospective study, so all the limitations we know about it. Um, and they did have three uh, block-related nerve injuries in about 3,000 patients. So again, brings that back to that number of about one in 1,000 when only nerve stimulator was used. So, you know, I think we can use our common sense, and at least personally, I 
believe that ultrasound can help us reduce the incidence of nerve injury, at least those that are related to needle trauma and intraneural local anesthetic, if we can avoid intraneural injection, if we can recognize it early and modify our technique. Ultrasound by itself is not going to do it. In other words, it's important to have the right tool for the job, which I think in this case we do have it, but it's also important to use the tool properly. So in conclusion, I think ultras we have reviewed the uh, latest literature on ultrasound and regional anesthesia safety in terms of outcomes. We have uh, reviewed the fact that these are infrequent outcomes and therefore some, somewhat challenging to study. Um, I think we have very fairly good data, at least from one meta-analysis. This is grade one type of data that tells us that ultrasound can decrease the rate of intravascular injection and perhaps through that mechanism last. And we also have about grade two type of data, retrospective reviews, some large prospective series that tell us that ultrasound may help us detect intraneural injection and perhaps decrease the rate of nerve injury. So thank you very much for your attention. That's it for me.